afternoon, everybody. This is Alexandra Metters of GalacticConnection.com, and we are having a really nice special radio show today. Uh, this is for next Tuesday. I'm doing a pre-record today, so bear with me. This is for uh, next week, which is September 8th. I can't believe we're already at September 8th. That's insane. But anyway, uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to present you some information on uh, Randy Kramer's psionics. Uh, what should I call it? Program? I don't know. We're calling it psionic boot camp. Boot camp. Excuse me. Boot camp. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this interview because we're not just going to cover psionics. We're going to do a variety of topics. But for those of you that are not familiar with Randy Kramer, uh, he is a captain and an officer who has been given authority to address the public on behalf of the command staff of the United States Marine Corps special section. Don't forget the special section. This was created by President Eisenhower in 1953 as a covert military intelligence branch. And think about it, this, uh, this isn't something that's too terribly rare, right? I mean, we've got a lot of covert branches. I mean, Randy, we should talk a little bit because people just really aren't familiar that much with the government and how it works. Uh, with specific authority over extraterrestrial, multidimensional, non-human, and off-world beings, consortiums and collectives either sanctioned or unsanctioned, within actual reach of any and all global, get that, global territory. He is the product of Soldier Augmentation Project Moon Shadow. Many of you who have been following his work, you are familiar with Moon Shadow. He, we'll dive into just a little bit today to refresh your memory. This was a training program for children, which began for him at age four, okay, get that, and later spent 20 years of duty off-world, over 17, and he's very proud to recite, what is it, 17 years? 17 years, three months, 14 three days. Three months, 14 days. He'll say that, like, constantly. Because he loves bars. He wanted to I live. Counting. He wanted to stay there for the rest of his life. <clears throat> no, I was counting the days until I got to leave. <laughs> he finished his service aboard the EDF SS Nautilus as a pilot in the last three years of his duty of his 20 years under Project Radiant Garden. Guardians, excuse me. And in August of 2013, his superior officers requested that he consider going public with their blessing. And he began to share his personal experiences with being off-world in April of 2014. So he's only been at this for a little over a year and a half or so. And uh, so now he's back to civilian life. <clears throat> and how's that going for you, Randy? Um, well, I mean, it's it's a funny gray area, right? Because I, I, <laughs> I sort of have to live in the civilian world way more than I had to you know, when I was doing my tour of duty, but I'm still an active duty officer and uh, United States Marine Corps special section officers are commissioned for life. So you don't give up your commission or stop being an officer until you're dead. Because we have the technology to restore the body and, you know, put people into younger bodies. So technically, as it was explained to me, that clause is in there. So if I'm 99 years old and I'm, you know, getting across the floor in my walker, but they need me all of a sudden, they'll just drop me in a 30-year-old body or something and, like, I'm back in action. So old age doesn't mean that you're not of service. And they... they there are these, a lot of these contingencies that they just wanted to plan for, you know, just in case, and the notion that, well, what if there was some crazy invasion and we had a horrible shortage of officers and personnel? Well, then we could just go to all of our reserves and all the old guys that are walking around in walkers and put them in new bodies and, like, bring them back. So hopefully we won't have to do that, but, you know, technically until the day I die. And because of the emergency field commander clauses, which – allow me to speak publicly without violating uh, secrecy agreements, etc. Um, that makes me an active duty officer right now with all kinds of active legal authorities and authorizations. Now, this, um, this emergency clause... It's a, but it's, it's, a, it's a weird kind of gray area because, yeah, it's, it's a, under these emergency field commander clauses, etc. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's weird. And, of course, the military uses that all the time, whether we're in a state of war or not, right? 
Well, d- technically, we've been in a state of war for a while. I mean, a real one, because there are a number of parties that we're in active, have been in active war with, the ones that we know about and the ones that we don't know about. So we, we are able to justify a number of wartime like, clauses because we are in a state of war, as well as enacting certain civil war clauses because we're also in a state of civil war. We're also in a state of emergency, so that al- allows us to enact these emergency clauses. So, you know, when the conditions for these different clauses are met, that, you know, legally enacts them and enables them to sort of come into being. So the fact that we're at that level of sort of um, teetering on the brink is the only reason why those clauses would come into being is because we're teetering on the brink. If everything was cozy and warm, those clauses wouldn't go into effect and I would be you know, doing something else. Well, and for all of you that are not familiar with the military, I mean, once you've enlisted into the Marine Corps, I'm just going to choose that because that's uh, Randy's branch of service. Uh, You know, if you talk to Marines, they're once a Marine, always a Marine. I mean, they will go down, down, dying as a Marine. That's how they will see themselves. Anyway, so Randy... It's a different kind of training, for sure. They basically, they do a transfusion, they suck all your blood out, and they, <laughs> and they, they melt down all these American flags and, like, bugles and stuff, and they pump you back into your system, so you're just, you, you bleed red, white, and blue bugle at that point. I'm kidding, oh, of course. Oh, God. <laughs> Can you guys tell we're going to get a lot done in this interview? <laughs> Anyway, so <clears throat> let's let's get back to first of all. I mean, I have a bunch of other questions, but what I want to do is just make sure we take care of business and address the fact that Randy will be doing a psionic that's P S I O N I C boot camp, and this will be up at East SETI Ranch. Now, the dates are from September 25th through the 27th, okay? So you got a little more time to prepare to get your self up there. This is going to be in Trout Lake, Washington, up at the East City Ranch, as all of you know, the home of James Gilliland, and of course our awesome friends, Joseph and Ashley. Now this workshop will give you a much more in-depth basis on the fundamentals of the laws of psionics. Now the part I was interested in, it says, and military protocols for psionic self-defense, What really got my attention was, since the greatest threats and dangers do not come from fleets of ships and rows and rows of plasma cannons, but from beings, superior psionic output that can manipulate harm and distort a being with a lesser psionic output, this is a skill that people need. Proper psionic self-defense can level the playing field and allow psionically emergent beings with a lower psionic output to remain safe and self-determined. Advanced psionics are the key to communication between our space brothers and sisters, and fundamental psionic self-defense is the foundation to build for all other advanced psionic abilities. Now, everybody that has not met Randy, just make sure we are clarifying, when he uses the word psionics, he refuses to use the word psychic which is kind of bantered and and thrown around within the spiritual community a lot. So right out the gate, let's go ahead and clarify why psionics, what is the difference between that and psychic? Well, uh, terminology has the ability and the power to mean different things. And for way too many people in the world, um, you know, notwithstanding people who spend their daily lives in a kind of state of projected mental energy, but for your normal people, uh, psychics are people who, you know, read your palm for $20 and tell you that you're going to take a trip, get a new job, and meet somebody every time. Um, And, you know, someone who actually has a real psionic ability, that represents someone who is actually tapping into the real laws of Physics, which psionics are physics, is another reason why we use the word psionics, because they are uh, governed by a series of laws that are mathematical and everything, So, uh, and, and they're all governed under this umbrella of laws of energetic physics. So in a very, very, very real and scientific way, uh, we're talking about a very new branch of science that developed in the covert military space programs in the 20th century. It's something that we've had on planet Earth for a very, very long time, and it's something that people have been using on planet Earth for a very, very long time, but we've been calling it a lot of different things because there's been this, for centuries, you know, this kind of 
coming together of science and, you know, creativity and spirituality. And like they don't meet, they don't meet. And then somewhere, bang, they meet in the middle when we understand that whole minded brainwave patterning and psionics and science and mathematics are still all the things that affect remote viewing, intuitive healing, and all of the mentally projected abilities. So Science is the key. Absolutely. And we also, as we understand, brainwave development and brainwave mastery as being one of the major components for developing your psionic abilities. We also understand that it's super, super, super important that your hemispheres of your brain talk to each other in a friendly way. And if your right side of your brain is like, I totally believe, and your left brain is like, what are you talking about? That's a bunch of crap. Then you're going to have like a brain that's arguing with yourself, and you're going to have a really hard time at developing and using your abilities because there's going to be this part of you that's going to go, no way. So when the left brain part can go, oh, it's science, and the right brain, you can go, oh, yeah, I experience and I feel this, then you have this whole-minded experience. Your balanced hemispheres of your brain waves sort of start to happen. You end up with these sort of creative, whole-minded states, uh, awakened mind states that we call them, and then you can actually really develop your psionic abilities and your mental abilities. So it's super, super, super important for, e even for people, you don't really have to grasp it like I do. Just your brain has to go, oh, I understand mathy science. Oh, I understand creative, spatial, intuitive. Like when those parts of your brain can both nod in agreement that they understand the thing that you're talking about, that's when they come together and they work together. Otherwise, you're just battling your own brain between the part of you that's saying, yes, I can, and the part saying, no, you can't, and you'll just well, argue with yourself all day long. Actually, one of the number one reasons why people have difficulty in being able to get their connection with their guidance or to be able to get in that state. You know, I've, I have so many emails come in to me. Gosh, I can't, I can't seem to, you know, hear my guidance. I can't seem to relax. I can't seem to um, get into a silent state. And so much of that is of, of totally, of course, correlated with the communication between your right and left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And and I tell people all the time, a lot of it is practice. So I want to know, well, how do you feel about that? Well, certainly uh, what we understand about your brainwave development and brainwave mastery is that your brain waves will conform to whatever you practice. So if you, and, and that's consciously or unconsciously. So if you practice your daily life being anxious and worried, you're telling your brain waves to practice being anxious and worried every day, and they will do that very, very well because you're practicing it. So practice is certainly a, a major component, you know, doing it again and again and again. But we also understand that there are a list of pretty simple, straightforward techniques that are often overlooked uh, in people who are teaching meditative or mental focus techniques to try and get people to actually experience uh, a relaxed theta state or meditative state and have an experience. So one of the main things... I'll, I'll, gi I'll give it away. It's, 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 I'll certainly talk about it in the workshop, but um, relaxing your jaw and your tongue turn out to be this huge step that most people don't teach or learn because what happens is, let me tell you why, it's because when you're talking to yourself in your head, this is what's happening. The, 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 your muscles in your tongue and your jaw are talking to yourself. And when they're tight and you're closed, you're actually like, you're talking to yourself and you can't stop it in your head. So when you actually like, no, shut up, jaw, uh, no, quiet tongue, and you tell your jaw and your tongue to stop, and you just kind of let them hang there and relax, you're, you stop talking to yourself. So there is a direct connection between talking to yourself in your head and the muscle movements in your jaw and your tongue that talk so that you actually want to relax them to stop talking to yourself in your head. And as we also did it in the workshop, I showed that the color blue, just visualizing the color blue makes your alpha waves open up. So there are some very specific techniques that are also about, I could just say, well, you're doing it wrong. You know, I could just say, well, if you're having a real hard time doing it, you're doing it wrong. And practice, 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 but you're still probably doing it wrong. And not to insult people who teach or people who learn, but just in my experience and the people that I've learned from, we have learned that so often, even really good people and practitioners, knowledgeable practitioners of meditative and mental focus techniques, 
forget some stuff or never taught some things that are really simple that, you know, the sort of accumulating knowledge from 20 different sources over decades in a military intelligence program has, you know, been able to, for us That's to distill. That's awesome, Andy. That's awesome. And, yeah. you know, I was going to say, I know that there's one technique in particular that's extremely valuable uh, where you can take your tongue and touch it to the roof of your mouth and that enhances your connection. It, uh, that's, that's one question I have for you. Do you agree with that? What do you feel is actually happening when you do that? And my second question is there is a what proliferation of people that have a massive amount of uh, jaw issues everything from bruxism to TMJ, I happen to be one of them after the car accident I had. Is that possibly associated with the dark agencies sending some sort of uh, waves to keep you from having that connection if it's that much involved in cutting the down or closing down your connection? I'm just wondering, I mean, that, that, I just will, that was an aha moment. Yeah, I, I never, uh, pr basically, you kind of have to presume if there's a technology available for someone to use to suppress development, there's probably someone who's doing that because there are a lot of different sources of, of groups, individuals, programs who are using their technology, technology to suppress development. So I'd say without going into a, a ton of detail, probably, you know, there's some things that are going around psionic waves trying to keep people tight and tense. And, but I would say that the natural state of our civilization, which is not so natural, is probably the main culprit for that. We actually spend so much time energetically right here. Yes. Yes. Instead, instead of here, 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 and in the rest of our yeah. body, that it's easy for this part of your body to just go. You know, you're just right. tightened up all the time when you're and when you're not talking, you're and you're talking to yourself, and so your jaw is clenched and your tongue. I mean, this is all stuff that happens really unconsciously. Um, and so, what I would, but specifically, what I would say to touching your tongue to the top of your mouth, there is a, a channel connector that you connect to there for sure, and that starts an energy flow. But I would teach someone if I were teaching them this technique, you may connect, want to connect with that stick your tongue to your roof of your mouth to make that connection for a certain number of breaths. But when you achieve sort of your open theta state sort of breathing, everything really you want completely and totally in a relaxed state. By the time you reach that theta state, all this other stuff that you've been doing with your body and your brain and your techniques and your mudras, all that should be done and you should just be sitting in a completely still, unmoving position with everything in a completely relaxed state so that you're inside, not outside. Okay. So I would say so I would say that's a step. But it's not the end result that you're going for. It's a step that moves your energy in the right direction and gets you harmonized and focused. But that's not a meditative state. And there is a distinction that we'll certainly talk about the difference between thinking and meditating. There's a lot of people who think that they're meditating and they're just thinking. And I certainly hope that we'll have a mind mirror, which is a biofeedback device that will allow us to see the brain waves happening in the left and right hemispheres when we do the workshop. And I will actually not just be able to draw a chart up on the board and explain the brain waves, but actually show it because we'll have the device to show it. That's so, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you can actually show those things that I'm explaining. It yeah. won't be just like, believe me. No, no. Here, we can show you, you know, on the yeah. feedback device why that works and why this happens. And, oh, look, here are the unrelaxed brain waves. Here are the relaxed brain waves. Here's how you, yeah, anyway, we can do that and it'll be fun. Well, and the other thing about, you know, and I know there's a lot of people listening that would have that as a question, which is so many people, what they refer to as psychic attack, okay? Uh, from the information that I've received, the research that I've done, they are, they are bombarding our heads, I've heard, in particular, which uh, particular what have plates in the skull that they they target which cause all this jaw stuff so I, I i just thought that was a very interesting correlation that's the first time i've heard that randy well your bones and your your skull and your jaw are all a big radio antenna um, this is not this is not like a theory like we learned this back in the 60s yeah. when they figured out how to uh, beam FM uh, waves and microwaves into people's skulls so that you could hear sounds and music and so forth like right in your skull. People uh, who still have metal 
you know, work in their mouth, you know, can sometimes pick up radio frequencies. It used to be people with braces in their mouth could pick up the radio because you've got this, you know, your jaw and your, the metal's acting as an antenna. So it, your brain, your skull is actually an antenna that's, that's picking up frequency waves all the time. That's what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now, um, one of the first things that I teach in the uh, course is that one of the fundamental things we're teaching here is a what would be normally an elementary exercise on a planet or in a system where psionics is the norm. So if you lived on a planet where everyone just accepted that they have a psionic ability, you would learn these techniques when you're a toddler. And by the time you're age 9 or 10, you would have this very stable, uh, protective psionic bubble around your head that keeps all that crap out, mm -hmm. unless you want it to come in. So... It creates this, this filter so that everything's not just coming in, you know, with that you can't stop it. Because that's what makes people crazy. Yeah. We have we have hospitals full of people who are hearing way too many voices in their head and they can't shut them down. Yes. Uh, and the only thing that our current medical science thinks is the right thing to do is give them enough, you know, heavy tranquilizers until they stop hearing the voices. Problem solved. Yes. When, no, what you really need to do is teach that person how to have a psionic bubble around their head so they stop being bombarded by the voices and then maybe they can sit there and have a conversation and go, oh, that's a pretty good idea or no, that's a stupid idea and actually start having a conversation with those voices instead of being uh, controlled and tortured by them. Have you, ever, have you ever heard of the technique where you actually put an etheric helmet on the individual? Have, do you teach that? Well, yeah, I mean, I do. I, I, I call it the blue bubble helmet and so... <laughs> I call it I call it the blue bubble helmet um, because we kind of focus on these sort of blue and gold colors and it's kind of it can be whatever shape you want when I talk about it like you know I tell people to sort of form this bubble around your head but you can make it look or be like whatever you want it can be this big old giant helmet it can be whatever works for you um, and I, t I try and explain to people that how you visualize your psionic system how you program your psionic system is very much up to you uh, and you have a lot of leeway in how you have a bubble helmet or armor or psionic weapons or whatever that you want to do to sort of develop uh, a psionic self-defense system, which, I w again, I will go into a great length at, at the workshop on how what we've learned in the military about how we teach our people how to do that and what I would teach people to develop full psionic self-defense abilities. This is going to be a great opportunity for everyone and uh, I'm going to be through this video I will embed the link where you can go to purchase the tickets. Really reasonable for a two-day workshop. Right Rand? It's what 175? Yeah, yeah, it's under a couple hundred bucks. So. You know, I mean it's really affordable and uh, I can tell you this much, you'll be entertained from start to finish, even if it's really boring. Randy will be doing all kinds of interesting things up on stage. <laughs> I try and keep it lively. What can I say? I try and keep it lively. So I think one of the other questions right out the door is, uh, how difficult is this to learn, and how long will it take to perfect it, typically? Not hard to learn at all. Like I said, if, if you were on another planet where this was the norm, you'd learn this as a baby and as a toddler. So if, if babies and toddlers can learn it, it's not hard. Um, and like I said, it, like anything, it just takes a little bit of practice. But I would say that if you want to start I mean, I certainly, from a very short, short workshop that we did in July, had people telling me that from start to finish, they had an experience where they were able to develop a personal psionic ability and move from that point forward. So um, if you're getting people out the gate, having an experience where they're, oh, I understand what's happening here, and I feel this, and if I just practice this, it'll work. And I've gotten feedback from a few people who have continued to, like, do the exercises and stay on top of it. And have noticed a substantial amount of growth in their own personal development in that sense. So it's awesome. The, the answer to that is, you know, look, if you want to come and learn something and then give it some practice, you, something will happen and you'll start to develop over a, a period of time based on your own development. You want to like hit it hard and like do it twice a day, every day for the next six months. You'll develop really fast, I guarantee. Uh, you want to do 15 minutes a week for the next two years? Eh, it'll take a little more time. So it really depends on how much individual time people want to put in it. it it's, the, it's the ultimate give you back what you put into it because it's really developing your own machinations in your mind and your body.
I really, I just so agree with that because as I delved into my alchemy, the more hours upon hours upon hours that I spent in my so-called atelier or workshop, uh, it definitely accelerated my gifts and it opened me back up to um, my own potential. So I recommend if you're going to really get serious about becoming more psychically developed and what he refers to as <laughs> enhancing your psionic abilities, <laughs> You really need to commit. You got to commit. Like you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth every day, X number of times a day. You've got to make some sort of schedule that really gives you the results that you want and need. Okay, so don't forget that. Yeah, and I, and I know that a lot of teachers teach people to get up first thing in the morning and meditate between 5:30 and 6:30 a.m. because there's certain there there are notions and things that are about the way your brain and your body are moving through your daily process that some people think there are more ideal times to meditate than others. Maybe. I'll just say that I tried to like be a diligent get up in the morning meditator and there's been a few times in my life when I've had the world that I could do that in. But for the most part, that's ridiculous. The only time in my day that I could really make sure is the time that I'm going to sit down and do it is before bedtime. So, um, you know, and you're kind of, you want to get relaxed and kind of down into sort of almost Delta anyway. You're kind of going to go to sleep after anyway. So it seemed, it, it, it works for me. And so, and, and I, and sometimes, um, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon. I, I mean, it really depends on what your day, what your schedule can sort of fit in. If you're a nine to fiver, you might not be able to do it before nine. You might have to do it after five. Um, well, you know what? You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta figure it out. Yeah. The bottom line is you gotta make it work for you. And if you go to any workshop, trust me on this one, any workshop that you're going to go to, if they give you some parameters in which to work with, you know, if it's not working for your schedule, for your biorhythms, for example, Randy is a let's jump out of bed early kind of guy. Um, and I know that he likes to stay up really late because we've did that many nights up at East Eddie. Uh, you know, that's great. I'm not. I know <laughs> that I definitely function better if I get up after seven and I go to bed, you know, at least by midnight. So um, we have to honor our bodies and the way they function. So don't take a, whatever it is he's going to give you and say, oh, God, I can't do this, so therefore I'm just going to blow all these, these, you know, types of uh, parameters away, you know. Just make it work for you. Well, and because we're going to have a whole weekend, I will be able to spend a considerable amount of time talking about the importance of the mind-body connection. So we're not, when we talk about psionic development, we are talking about brainwave mastery. We are talking about mastering the mind. But one of the most important things to understand is that the mind is not all by itself. Yeah. The mind and the body are a connected experience. And when you, you have to have a mind-body practice or a mind-body connecting exercise or system of some kind to make it happen – or you might as well just be, you're wasting your time and you might as well be doing nothing. So, so, so we'll get a chance to talk about how very, very important the mind-body connection is to develop. Well, let's dive into that. And the first thing I want to ask you right out the gate is, can you define the distinct difference between the mind and the brain? That's first. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, essentially... Um, a mind is anything that can uh, think and hold memory, anything that can hold memory and think. So, and anything that essentially has a geometric lattice structure has the ability to hold memory and to think. So, uh, that means we have a very wide set of parameters on what can be a living mind and what can be a living thing. So, uh, a mind is a... Your mind is basically this energetic uh, matrix that is functioning inside and overlapping of your brain. And it, some people would think of it as, you know, your chakra centers or this whole sort of energetic center. And in that very, very real way, as your chakras are these little holographic geometric lattice structures that are dynamically moving, they're like little engines that move, they're moving memory centers. So we can say that 
this is your mind because this is an energy center of thought and memory. But this chakra is also a mind because it's a center of memory and thought. Your heart chakra is also another kind of mind because it is an energy center that can hold memory and thought. And all of your chakra, anything, all of your chakras, all of these different energy centers just become a different kind of mind as we explain that something can have memory and can have thought. And it just has to have these sort of basic energetic physiological geometric shapes for it to be able to hold thought or to have energy. So that's a mind and your brain is this biological thing that connects your physical body to the world that allows you to interact and decodes all of this information so that you can experience reality like a person. So how would one distinguish the difference between a mind in a chakra or of a chakra or being part of a chakra versus the cells themselves? Well, because the the thought and the energy matrix is going to come from the energy matrix. So the thought and the energy patterns are going to come from the chakra itself. The cells are going to be the embodiment of that energy. So they're going to reflect that energy, health, ill health, function, dysfunction, etc. Um, and... Again, there's a, there's a relationship, so a healthy body will encourage that energy matrix to be more healthy. A healthy energy matrix encourages the body to be healthy. Ill matrix, ill body encourage the other. So they, they support each other and, you know, will do for each other what they do, whether they're healthy or dysfunctional or whatever. They I mean, you know what I'm going to, which is cellular memory. Right. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. And so when we talk about, oh, when we talk about all types of memory, the ability for every uh, everything to store memory, your cells become little tiny holographic memory chips. So they have the ability to store all kinds of memory, but they're also just like, like a video card. Like it, the, the memory held in your cellular memory isn't a thought center that can process all of that information. It's just the recorded data. So you can think of your cellular memory as an infinite YouTube channel of memory of things that happened and occurred, but without your chakras or your mind or your consciousness ability to process or think about it, it's just a bunch of images on a screen that mean nothing. So w without the interpretation of your mind, your consciousness, and your chakras, all that cellular memory doesn't mean anything. But because your mind and your body are so connected and you have that mind-body connection, that's your inner relationship between your whole person. So you have to deal with all of that cellular memory as it's in your body. It's not just a YouTube channel that you can click on to somebody. I don't like my YouTube channel. I want to go to somebody else's. Like, no, that's your cellular memory. You got to deal with that. That's your channel. And so, but, but without all of that consciousness and that mind, it's just images. It's nothing. It's, it's the, the memories don't mean anything without a consciousness or a person to process it or experience it. So distinguish when someone is referring to their higher self. Are they referring to the mind? in your opinion? No, if, if they're talking about their actual higher self, the higher self is actually up here in your eighth chakra. Um, so your higher self is existing in this other place of, of mind and it's this whole other place and thought process. So if you're actually connecting and talking to your higher self, um, that's actually a higher dimensional mind self that's connected to you. Good description. And how would you define like the matrix itself that we live within? Isn't that the mind of some warped personality? No, that's that's collective reality. And collective reality becomes the thing that we all kind of agree upon is where we live. And that has a lot to do with, you know, the hundredth monkey, you know, sort of um, critical mass consciousness, you know, kind of a thing. If enough of everybody believes in something, then that affects the global consciousness and the global reality of sort of accepted reality, um, consensus reality, you want to sort of think of it as, but it's, it's, it, consensus reality is a battle at the moment between those who want 
reality to be one way and those who want reality to be another way. So consensus reality right now is a chaotic mess because depending on what city you live in, what room or house you're in talking to and who you're, what dinner table you're standing around will depend very much on what reality you're dealing with. So you and I may be having a conversation about one kind of reality, but there's a certain group of people that might – you know, flip if they were channel surfing and got to this conversation, they go, "What? Those people are crazy!" Because we live in a reality that is so very, very far differently removed than the reality that that person lives in. Okay. So, consensus reality is a chaotic mess right now because we have massive propaganda, we've polluted education, and we're just trying to confuse everybody in order to sort of maintain chaos. Divide and conquer. It's just divide and conquer. But. And it's upside down. Well, now, you know, I had a thought when I was going through your stuff. Uh, you went through my stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no, Randy, you're junk. <laughs> hey, now. No, that's just a personal joke, guys. Don't, don't, don't touch. I think it is. Don't go touching my junk unless your hands are warm. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, because you've been trained, and let's just take the 300 other, you know, 299 others that have been trained like this in your particular uh, group. Now, if you were trained about psionics and the way in which the mind works, the body works, this, you know, probably got into the soul, you probably got into um, the ability to maintain your thought uh, so much so, so that you would be less apt to be manipulated, um, especially during a time of extreme stress and that kind of thing. Would you, venture to say that because of this training that you know almost as much as the military does about the way in which the body reacts and is capable of processing data and being able to prevent data from entering your field. Yeah. And I'm, saying this, I, I, I'm saying this because of your experience. You know, you, you, you learn this information and then you went out and you were in battle and you experienced it and you applied it on a constant basis. So I guess what I'm asking you is, you know, the military is all of us kind of look at them, this, this big kind of dark shadowed government Right. Of course, you know, there's the military and then there's the dark shadow government, right? I mean, there are good parts of military. Uh, many, but, many, many factions of everything. Absolutely. Yes. And we tend to look at them and go, God, they have so much information and data because they've been putting the body and the human being in a Petri dish for so very, very long. And they've studied the being through every single war, through every POW, through every concentration camp they have studied and compiled enough data to know what breaks us and what doesn't so i kind of started thinking when i was reviewing your material that here we all are especially those that are enlightened that are listening to this interview and they want to enhance their their skills and and basically get their gifts back okay or just remember right. to get their gifts back um i started wondering well Aren't we essentially in a sort of war type battle where they are doing everything they can to prevent us from stepping into that? Is this something that you have experienced, you know, through your, through, you know, from your childhood on? I mean, are there, are there things that you were taught that have given you such a laser beam clarity as you walk out on the street and you go down through, say, a mall, can you feel, sense, almost touch what types of, I don't know, uh, waves or technologies are being used on you? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. There, uh, it's – yeah, I mean, I, 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 I suppose I don't spend a ton of time talking about it because I don't – 
like to spend a ton of time talking about me. But uh, yeah, I, I, as far as like how I perceive what's going on in the world and with people's minds and what's happening psionically, not just to be individuals, but what's happening all around and so forth. Oh yeah, no, I, I have, I'd say that I have a heightened sense of that for sure. And, you know, I, I have a team of people that I can confer with too. So if I think or perceive something's going on, I can confer with my psionic specialists and I can confer with the command staff and I can confer with intelligence officers and like say, hmm, I, I'm kind of sensing this is happening. Can you confirm or deny this? And so I also have the added ability to be able to check that information against a bunch of other people who can check that information. So, um, and I would have to say that I've been doing that long enough that it, it and I'm getting enough accuracy over time that I feel pretty good about my ability to discern that fairly accurately. And it's definitely... Um, I mean, I definitely go walk down the street and experience life in a way that other people probably don't. And there are certain, there are certain like crowd, crowded environments that I will avoid for that reason because, I mean, it gets really like mentally crowded and it gets really mentally loud and it gets really like psionically busy uh, in a way that's not very enjoyable for me. And But there are other there can be other types of crowd situations that can be really fun psionically uh, music festivals. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there can be, I mean, depending on what really is sort of the vibe of what's happening can be super fun or super crazy. So there are certain things I avoid and certain things that I might be drawn to, but I'm certainly paying attention to what's going on all the time. And mostly it's really noticeable in most people's behavior because most people are like a weather vane when it comes to that. Most people have very little control over what's happening to their sort of psionic waves happening in and out of them. So I do a lot of observing what's happening by just basic day-to-day -day behavior dealing with people. Are, are, are people in, you know, a positive communicative mood or are people kind of locked up and not sure what's happening? People having physical reactions to things, mental reactions to things. Is it the day where everyone seems to be having an emotional problem that day? I mean, there's, there's things that let you know when they've, you know, cranked up a knob somewhere or sometimes it's just the waves coming in. But I, I think that to try and answer your question, there's a lot of information and a lot of waves, psionic waves that are happening every day, every minute. So trying to figure it all out can be a little tricky, but I would say that I have as best a background as anybody in trying to be able to discern what's happening. And I feel like my own ability to deal with it is sufficient enough that I don't feel like I'm getting knocked around by it, that I can feel like I understand it because if when I didn't understand it, I got knocked around by it all the time. And now that I don't get knocked around by it, I feel like the only reason that happens because I have a solid understanding of what is happening sure. and I don't let it affect me. Sure. And and you have the experience and the knowledge to be able to see so you're you're able to you're capable of fully stepping into your authority. And that's what I run into all the time with these awesome people. They're walk they're writing in and they're talking about some of the there's some very strange new developments as of late, and, and maybe people probably can read between the lines why I'm asking the questions I'm asking, because I'm starting to see some new developments in the way that the dark are trying to uh, target individuals. Sure. And, and I think it would behoove you, if you have any information, do you know a bit as to how they target individuals um I, I mean there's so many different methodologies that can be used to target an individual um there are larger scale technologies which are affecting mass populations which can be honed in and targeted on individuals but usually if they're attacking an individual it's going to be they're going to use a psionic specialist or they're going to use a um a beam emitter from a helicopter or an airplane or something mm -hmm. uh you you i mean you gotta like you got to uh kind of like demand high attention for them to like get satellite time for you to like beam the satellite beams at your brain because that's they don't have time to beam the satellite beams at everybody you got to like you got to warrant satellite time but um you know sure there, there are ways to attack and manipulate i mean you know a plain white van you know parked down the street that's got a you know an, an, an em transmitter in it that's sending you know focusing sending a beam down to somebody's house or something like that they do that stuff all the time but Basic psionic self-defense would make that less of an issue because you could just block it out. 
And this is why it's so important, folks, that we all learn. I mean, listen, you know, I know all of us have uh, techniques and tools that we've already been using, but one more tool in your toolbox can make the difference, you know, for a much more healthy life. And I feel so much compassion to all of those that have written in, especially because of our implant removal process that we've done. Uh, we see just a myriad of different ways in which they're messing with people. And it's, it's, it's screwed up. It's totally screwed up. So if there's anything that we can do, and it's basically happening because we have been kept in the dark. You know, we have not been trained to this type of thing. So the, do you feel that the most important thing to start with is that you have to kind of have the mental understanding? I mean, are you, are you basically kind of giving people a, a classroom situation where, okay, here's the laws? so that they're capable of understanding what they're doing or can someone just take these methods and go to it and they don't really have to fully understand all the physics and everything else because I, I i know there's probably people out there where they're thinking oh my god if i have to learn all these laws of physics that could really go over my head and they're going to lose interest well um the first thing about laws of physics is that most laws of physics are not hard at all to understand most people who think that the laws of physics are difficult have not sat down and like cracked a physics book to look and see what the laws of physics are because most of the laws of physics um they're laws so by being a law as opposed to a theorem or you know a theory or any of the other things that aren't a law when you talk about sort of how solid something is mathematically or scientifically um a law represents something basic and fundamental and so it's not usually like you know a law of law of physics isn't 10 lines of a paragraph of of complex words and equations it's usually each law is like something very very simple that explains this is the basic law this is the basic math that covers that so for instance the first law of psionics not hard Okay. First law of psionics is that all thought produces psionic energy. Where thought is the cause, psionic energy is the effect where, and then this is where the math part kind of comes in, where P equals psion, psionic, where P equals psionic energy in psions per second, which is measured with a psionometer. Now, we have psionometers in the military, and I have the ability to build one so that we can actually demonstrate how these laws of physics operate and I when I talk about the laws of uh, psionics one of the things that I absolutely do is distinguish talking about psionics in the lab versus psionics in a field because how we talk about psionics in a lab and how we would prove psionics in a lab is a little bit different but um, basically uh, the, the laws of psionics lecture that I do not hard not hard to understand the math is pretty simple uh, I kind of stop at law five because basically the, the laws that go beyond that are more calculus because that's governing like when you have a lot of different psionic objects or you know centers coming into effect one another and how you sort of have to work out these uh, functions and equations to figure out what's happening and then it gets weird but the first five laws are pretty straightforward the math is pretty straightforward and pretty simple it's not hard and again it's not so important that people like walk away going oh, I can quote the laws of psionics it's, more, <laughs> it's much more important that they sat there watched it and went Oh, okay. I, I see where he's going with that. It's just more important that it connects to the part of their brain that goes, oh, hey, this is, this is not just something made up. There's laws of physics that govern this and they make sense. Um, and when I was presenting before, and you know, this was the first time anyone, I want to point this out, when I did the lecture in July, it was the first time ever anywhere in the world that a military officer got to present to the civilian population the laws of psionics. I was pretty proud about that. Yes. Um, and so when I did that, really good. thank you. And when I did that, I'll have to say that the only group of people that I was concerned with was going to receive that well were the mathematician, scientists, and the engineers in the room, because those are the people who were going to judge whether I was giving a good physics lecture or not. Ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I had a, 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 
lots of those people who came up to me afterwards and, and really wanted to thank me for bringing science into it. And this funny gray haired old engineer who said, you know, if I had physics professors like you when I was in college, I probably would have paid attention in class. Okay. So, so the, the, the feedback I got from my ability to present them as laws of physics and as a science class was sufficient enough for me to think that I, I can do that. I got that part down, but it's not so important that people walk away like, I can now teach the laws of science. I don't want you to teach the laws of psionics. I just want you to understand them so that then when we get to psionics in a field, which is how you practice the techniques and how you do your, your mental focus techniques, practice your blue bubble helmet, and how you practice your self-defense techniques, that's the practical application of understanding that there's science behind it, there's laws of physics behind it, and then we're mostly just going to talk about brainwave mastery, brainwaves, and how you get your brainwaves to do what you want, and how that you practice the mental focus techniques and get the actual effects that you want to feel the mental and physical differences that let you know. There's uh, a chart, we call it the, uh, the table of uh, subjective landmarks. So there are like a series of subjective landmarks, like when you know you feel or experience a certain set of criteria that you're having an experience at a certain brainwave level. So we'll talk about that to say, because people say, well, I don't know if I was really meditating or not. And well, let's go to the list, the table of subjective landmarks and find out where you were on that. Because you don't always have a mind mirror biofeedback device to look at your brainwaves, but there are other ways to know where you're at and to know when you're having yeah. an experience that tells you when you're having progress. It's like you need that reference. And the other thing I really want you to go over uh, is the light, the dark, and the corrupted light. So let's go back to that in a minute. But the other thing I also wanted to say is I had been taught by a, a hermetic teacher uh, a great technique, I'm wondering if you incorporate that, where you basically see yourself almost sitting in a cockpit right where your pineal gland is. Okay, so you put your tension there, you actually see yourself sitting there and there's, there's windows all around you. The key is it's 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the room in which you sit in, you can create it into anything you want, but it's the color of a light blue. Everything is blue, everything. Even the clothes you wear, if you choose to have clothes in there, is blue. Um, anything like that? Um, I mean, that's certainly a specific, like, how you tell someone to build, you know, their their laboratory, their psionic laboratory, or their cockpit, or the bridge. I mean, it can, you know, it, it can be a the the room that is your sort of room of your mind that you choose to be in can be a number of different things. It can be your choice. Yeah. So, but that's certainly something that we talk about is. You know, when you go into your mental space, what's it going to be? You know, is it going to be your artist loft? Is it your laboratory? Is it your bridge of your ship? Is it your cockpit or your spaceship? I mean, what is it? And so that you can define what that place is visually. You define, define visual cues about it, colors, okay. sensory awareness about it, so that when you go in, so that when you're breathing and, and slowing your breathing and your brain waves to get it back into a meditative theta state, you're remembering all of those mental cues that will take you right back into that place. And that becomes a very stable place to do uh, psionic development from and personal work from. Absolutely. Now, don't, do you also feel the importance of being able, uh, this was very emphatically taught to me, being able to see behind yourself no, for certain techniques, that, that that's something to teach people. If you really want to teach people how to astrally travel and you really want to teach someone how to be like, how to be astrally fluid inside their body, teaching them how to do sort of 360 returns and looking behind you and so forth, that's really important. But I don't consider that a fundamental exercise. I don't consider that a fundamental technique. I'd consider that more of an intermediate or advanced technique. But as a fundamental technique, I would be much more concerned that people can have an awareness of being inside their body and a part of their body at the same time and not just feeling like, they're trapped in their body or that they can't be inside their mind. So get the fundamental would be experiencing that theta state, that internal state while your mind and your body are also one at the, but experiencing that state is more important than being able to master direction in that state. Good point. And, and what is your opinion of people that they just, 
meditate all day long and they're not in their physical body, basically. They're, they're elsewhere. You know, you hear that all the time within the community. Oh, I just want to get out of here. <clears throat> Um, I really, I want to smack those people upside the head. I just, I, I really want to bitch slap them really, really hard and say, um, why are you here then? Like, if you came here to get the fuck out, like, why are you here? Like, then, you know, put a bullet in your head and get the F out of here then if you don't want to be he here. has a problem telling you exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, if, if, if you really are one of those people that feels like you don't want to be here, you don't belong here, get the F out. If, if you are one of the people who came here because you knew that you had something to do to try and help be a problem solver and be a part of the solution and not part of the problem, then quit your effing whining and learn how to be here and live with that. You know, like sometimes it sucks, but you know what? That's being in the battlefield sometimes it Absolutely. sucks but you're there to you're there to fix stuff you're not there to feel good and make tea and cake for everybody um you know we we have specialists we don't have touchy feelists you know i mean so uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 as much as i as much as i respect someone who can like spend that much time in their sort of you know spiritual meditative state like good for you but my main question to that person is what have you done lately like what have you done for your world, your community, your planet, your people? What have you done for a family, a group of people? Like, if, if you're just telling me that you're sitting all day long and you're achieving these amazing meditations that do nothing, nothing in any kind of practical way that you can explain to me as a practical impact on the world around you, that slap you. You're wasting your time. What are you doing? Like... <laughs> You know, quit, quit, quit wasting your gifts and your talents on, you know, like making lotus blossoms in your head all day long and not actually doing anything. And this is um, such an important time to take action for the populace. Well, and there are a number of teachers who I have met, particularly from some yoga schools, who really teach this very, very, you know, detached, no, no, just meditate, get away from it. And, like, and I just want to, like, smack those people and say, look, we all live here. And until we can fix here, none of us are leaving. So those of you who think that you can just spend all day long meditating under a tree and then you're going to get to leave and the rest of us will stay behind, <laughs> yeah. no. This you're just going to change the rules for you on where you are here and how you have to stay here. But you're not leaving until we all get to leave. Yeah, because the core issue is why are we here in the first place? Okay, if people, if people really focus on why are you here in the first place? And I really, I personally feel we truly are on a mission. And I see it all day, every day. Every person that comes through that I have personal essences made for, all of the IRPs, essays, DNAs, spiritual past life clearings that we do, when I tap in and I'm talking to you on the inner plane, you are fully front and center going, I have a mission. And uh, we do. We have a mission. We're not just, <laughs> as Sheldon Nidal said to me, I mean, I just, I love this. He said, would you pick this place to go on a vacation? No. Come on, <laughs> folks. We didn't come here to go on vacation. I mean, I love Mother Earth. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think it's just spectacularly gorgeous, you know, where they haven't done severe damage. Yeah, okay? but she's kind of in crisis, so it's not exactly a vacay spot. Yeah. So we're here because of that. So anyway. And I can say that throughout the process of regaining and restoring full memory, that even when I only had the most vague sense of who and what I was, I absolutely positively knew I had a mission that was the most important thing, and anything and everything and everyone else in the world came backseat burner to the mission, whatever that was. So that's never, ever, ever left my mind or my center ever, that there was a mission that was more important than everything else. I can guarantee you that most of the people listening to this interview are exactly in that same place. And that doesn't mean that you can't have a, a successful marriage or relationship or what have right. you, but really first and foremost, you have to make a decision. How dedicated are you to get your mission done? Every single one of us play a very important role to the mosaic, okay? Like everybody has that little piece of importance because we can't just all sit back and let only 10 of those pieces of mosaic do all the work, right? right. 
We're all here together to get this job done. And I really do feel that the psionics workshop is going to assist people. Now, get, let's get back to mental focus. I, I can't begin to say how significantly important that is in your ability to communicate with your guides. So let's talk a little bit about that. What do you, what do you, you know, give me some basics as to what you teach or what are your concepts? Um, I mean, there's a number of different ways that you can teach focus, um, and probably one of the most straightforward ways to teach focus is to have a focal point, um, and I mean that literally, not metaphorically. So um, I, I know people who will choose to, you know, it's good to have a spot. Uh, where you sit or you lay or you do your meditation, that's your spot because then your brain and your body will become familiar and relaxed in that spot and it becomes easier to go into a theta state. Um, and so depending on where your spot is and what you're looking at um, to put, you know, I know some people who will take like a little red thumbtack or pushpin and stick it right, you know, in the middle where they want to stare at the wall and that becomes a focal point. Um, a candle meditation as far as like you take you have to have a short wick on your candle because you don't want like one of those candle flames that's whipping all over the place you need a short wick so you have a very tight stable flame on your candle and you know you want it in a position that's like about at your focal point and then essentially that gives you something to lock your gaze onto so basically teaching your eyes where to go and how to lock into a position um, is definitely one of the most important ways to learn how to focus because what you learn when you're trying to sort of be in your head and your eyes and your focus is going all over the place and you go, what is going on here and when you can lock it down and when you can you know really find that point and it's it's hard like um for anyone who especially the mind chatter well and if, I, I want to make a comparison like for if if you're if you're a person who hasn't like read a book in a really, 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 really long time, you may open up a book and find that your eyes don't want to like stay in a line and that they want to bounce all over the page. Well, that's, that's sort of a natural thing that your eyes want to do is bounce all over the place. And we train ourselves like when we're kids to focus and read in a straight line. And we don't remember often what it was like for us, how like, it was hard to focus your eyes on that page and like follow the sentence to the end because you want to jump all over the place. Right. So that same thing happens when you're trying to learn a mental focus technique or learn to meditate. Your eyes want to kind of bounce all over the place and you kind of have to go, no, focus right there and give them something to focus on. Now, you don't have to have a thing on the wall. You don't have to have a candle. You can use the body, you tip of your nose. You can use an imaginary spot in the middle. There's a number of different things you can do. And there are a number of different exercises that you can do do mostly yoga techniques that you do with your breathing in your body so that then when you do try to go into a meditative or theta state, focusing is a whole lot easier. So some of what that is happening too is your is body restless. It's like, oh, I'm like, and you're like, you can't focus because really what's happening is your body is very restless. Some of that can have to do with diet. If your bowels are like trying to digest something that's really making it difficult to focus mentally internally, which can happen, uh, or if you're really stressed about something, your body's overtired or over anxious. And if you're one of those people that, you know, you like you live in this kind of like stressed state where your upper body is just locked into this kind of tight muscle position, then you're going to find it a bit more difficult to relax uh, and also to, to find that internal focus point because your body is going to be doing this whole other kind of focus. So it's a lot of different techniques on getting your body to relax, getting your brain and your body to connect, being able to focus, understanding the basic principles and the laws, and then just applying those fundamental techniques until you feel an effect of like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen. So anything that you learn how to do takes practice. And hardly anybody is really good at something the first time they do it. Most people, even me, the first time I do something, I usually suck at it. And it takes some practice and no. some time. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it takes some practice to get good at something. Now, I tend to get good at things faster than other people because I tend to pick up on things pretty quickly. But usually, you know, the first time, if I've never done something the first time, I, you know, fumble it and screw it up just like anybody else. So meditation. 
Okay. Uh, what I tell a lot of people is they feel that they have to do a specific type of thing to meditate. And I am a big proponent that if you're not someone who wants to sit down on the ground in a yoga, you know, cross-legged position, uh, and you really get into some, you really kind of go out there uh, when you go and you smell flowers, right. or you go and you garden, or you take a hike. Uh, to me, that is also a meditative state. Would you agree with that? Yes, and when we talk about the sort of active and passive body and mind states, which is another thing we'll talk about, um, there are different ways in which your body can achieve a meditative state that is both passive or active. Uh, moving can still achieve a meditative state, but you will certainly have a more uh, active and awake mind than you will sort of having a calm, relaxed one. If you're really trying to enter a, a deep theta state, can be difficult to enter a deep theta state when you're up and moving around. But when you're up and moving around, you can certainly achieve a balanced hemisphere state, and you can certainly achieve open theta, alpha theta states, and awakened mind states. So you absolutely don't have to be sitting meditating to achieve an awakened mind state or a creative mind state. You can absolutely do that walking, gardening, meditating. Um, there are number, yeah, there's so many different things that you can do that apply that with. And so what, what I will say is that there are a, um, there, there's some discussion about that that I can talk about, but most importantly, what I'd like to bring up is that, um, one school of thought says that there are 122 different methods for meditating. And you're either performing one of, doesn't matter what you're doing, you're either performing one of the 121, what we sort of consider male uh, forms of meditation, which is a process. You do this, then 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 you do this you're meditating. Um, and that there are 121 methodologies for that, and whatever methodology you've ever learned will conform to one of those 121 methodologies, or you're using the 122nd methodology, which is the female methodology, which is different every time. Hmm. So Wow, you, interesting. So you don't in any way, shape, or form have to say, I got to do this, then this, then this, then this. It's whatever gets your brain and your body down into that theta state, out, through your out, opens your alpha bridge and gets you into that theta state. Okay, whatever, whatever you do to get there, however you get there, is what gets you there. And so you can either have a method or you can have a, let's wander this way this time and see if I get there. And then, you know, that's a female method. Okay, so... But we're talking about kind of left, when we say male, female, we're talking sort of about masculine, feminine, left, right sides of the brain. We're not really talking about genders. But... Right, of course, of course. Okay, so there's 122 male type meditative states and there's 128? Right. 121, 120. there's 121 male techniques, one female technique, because oh, in the sorry. female technique, one, Sorry. one, okay. one female technique, it's different every time, it's never the same. Okay, now that leads me to my next question, I've already had this down, and that is, what is your opinion of ritual? Uh, I've had this conversation with some masters in my background, very interesting discussions. I'm curious, what do you feel as to the benefit or non-benefit to ritualism? Rituals to me are like training wheels, and so they can kind of um, get you comfortable with experiencing or feeling a certain type of energetic or mental or psionic state, but that over-dependence on a ritual is going to be the same problem of over-dependence on the training wheels. You're never going to learn how to really ride a bike if you're always using the training wheels. So uh, ritual to me is a, is, can be a very valuable tool, but it can also be a thing that keeps people stuck for millennia. Okay, thank you. And what I want to add to that is throughout my uh, walk of really realizing my own alch alchemy, okay, and doing a lot of work with St. Germain, for example. I thought, thought that I had to follow a very specific ritual in order to reach that elevated state. And I found out 
yeah, that helped for a while, but I don't have to do anything like that. And once you get to a place where you've done enough of this and you've practiced enough of this, uh, it's just become, it's going to become very, very, you know, you're not even going to have to think about it. It's just going to come, which leads me to my next question, which is how people interpret whether they're, as you say, psionic or other people call psychic, um, they, their interpretation might dissuade them from actually realizing that they were literally being psionic at that moment. What do you say to that? Yes, that is absolutely a, that's absolutely a problem that some people will think, oh, I didn't do the ritual, I didn't do it just right, and therefore I can't be experiencing something because I cheated or I didn't go through the steps. Or I mean, there's all these different things that your brain will try and tell you, no, you didn't actually experience that. Or your ego will tell you, yeah, you got it down. You're all <laughs> godlike and everything. It's cool. You don't have to keep practicing this stuff, um, which, is, which is an ego trap when your ego starts telling you no no you got this down you don't need to do this anymore um that's totally ego trap but but there's the the the, the self-esteem low self-esteem trap too of like i don't know did i do it did I, i'm not sure if i did it right do i deserve this and um we call that the ego pendulum so while we're on the ego pendulum um let's talk about that real quickly yeah. which um is basically i feel great oh, i suck i feel great oh, i suck i feel great oh, i suck and you kind of go back and forth between i'm awesome and i can do it no i really suck i don't think i can and it's back and forth and back and forth and some people think well how do i just stay positive all the time how do i just stay awesome all the time no you don't want that Exactly. That's not what you want to do because basically by pushing it that way, it's just going to swing the other way. It's just going to keep going it's back a natural and forth. Of physics. It's called, that's why it's called the ego pendulum. Now, what you do is you get off the pendulum and just do your job. You just stop worrying about whether I'm awesome or I suck and I, I just have a job to do and I need to do it. So the, the trick – neutrality. Yeah, it really is. It really is about having a state of neutrality about it, and you just go, uh, "I'm not going to get on this pendulum anymore because it's just back and forth and back and forth." And so you just get off it, and you stop being concerned about whether you're awesome or whether you suck at all, and you just do your job and be focused on trying to do the best that you can. Randy, I tell people this all the time. In the in the old days, I used to get a lot of emails uh, about, you know, "Oh my God, you put this article up." And, and it, it described things in this way, and, and it's making reference to this. Oh, my God, I can't believe you put this up. And I have been super consistent in stating to people over and over again, my job with the blog is to basically present you this side of the scale, maybe some really conspiratorial information, some factual information about what's going on behind closed doors. <laughs> Am I boring you? No, no, I didn't sleep a lot last night. It's all good. And then, you know, and presenting them a lot of the, you know, the love and the spirituality and the cohesiveness of the community and that kind of thing. But your job is to remain neutral and to observe these articles. And what I mean by that is not observe them like, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with that. What I mean is to observe them when you're reading them with complete neutrality. Say, wow, that's very interesting that China just came into the Alaskan waters with their uh, ships and there was this big hoo-wah-wah with the military, oh my God, the sky is falling. It's not about you going, ah, oh my God, we're going to go into a state of war. You know, it. we, what I say to people, Randy, and I'm just curious, what I say to people is, that is part of our mission, is to hold this space right now mm -hmm. in a state of neutrality. We are such an exceptional group of people who have the power and the awareness and the expansion to be able to hold that space. It's so important right now not to get whacked out and carried away. And that means whether you're Christian or Muslim or Jewish or whatever. I mean, even those are boundaries, unfortunately, that have kept us separate from one another. It is our responsibility, I feel, for the planet because the planet can't do it. They're not doing it. We are. 
So it, it, it takes fingers to do stuff, and the parts of the planet that doesn't have fingers needs us. Yeah. Yeah, big time. And again, you know, why are we having this conversation with Randy today? Because I feel this is one of the most important holes within the spiritual community is psychic protection. And he like he does not like the word psychic, by the way. So I'm going to say psionic protection. Okay. But, you know, everybody knows psychic, so that's why. But uh, glad you talked. Well, and we're changing the lexicon, so yes. keep using the word psionic. We'll retrain everybody to use the right word soon enough. Okay, so everybody, <laughs> I'm going to really try to start using psionic. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to get a hell from Randy. Oh, you are. <laughs> you will. Seriously, you will. I'll get, so, you a big, I'll get you a big palm reader sign, and I'll stick it up in your living room that says psychic $20 on it. I'll get you one of those. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> personality, man. Um, hey, so no, It's like an albatross around your neck. It's a shaming <laughs> tool, okay? <laughs> I love you, too. But um, you, you mentioned something about focus, okay? Uh, a lot of people are really concerned about the younger generations being so obsessed and completely, I don't know, just completely intoxicated with video games. And I was wondering, has the military, I would imagine you have delved into this, has the military kind of tapped into the advantages of our younger generations having that ability to play these video games what do you feel that that is benefiting the planet from the state of psionics? That is a really good question that we could actually spend a whole, like, we could, we could actually talk about that for hours. Um, well, we because in another interview. Yeah, well, it just it, you're just it turns out that you're hitting the tip of an iceberg of a subject that it, that turns out to be so large and so vast that um, I'll try and sum up a few things about it, but really we could, but really we could talk about it for a long time, and I could put forth example after example after example well, to sort of it. like we'll do that, uh, you know, at least answer the question, and then we'll yeah. we'll do an so, interview on it. And, and, and I'll say this because uh, I, I, can, I can say this as someone who, when I was 10 years old, got my first Atari 2600, for those of you who remember the old, you know, one joystick, one button, 8-bit, uh, eight, eight you know, like stuff on the screen. Like, I got that when I was 10 years old. So I am absolutely grown up in the video game generation, and I have had video games my entire life, and I have played them my entire life. And uh, my best friend, uh, who I've known since the fifth grade, I mean, we got our Atari 2600s for Christmas the same year, and when we hang out together, it, we still it's for game night and we play Xbox together. Okay, so so video games are still a part of my life. But that being said, I can say that I have observed the field of video gaming and what's being produced and what's being played in such a wide level that I could speak for hours about like we could go down the list of like these are shitty games that no one should ever play because this is going to warp your mind and make you think stupid retarded oatmeal thoughts versus the list of games that I could go down that are about real problem solving real spatial awareness real physical or dimensional awareness the real training of psionic or, or mental abilities um, the ability to sort of visualize things in a dynamic way so that you know in a dream or meditative state the ability to sort of visualize or experience something as a virtual person can kind of happen. And so really understanding that what's happening in a psionic practice and a meditative practice when you're understanding the sort of physical state, virtual state, uh, your person, your avatar, these are really like conversations and tools that cross over between computing and video gaming like like right crossover so there's abs oh yeah so there's absolutely a very very real way that these things can be used as very very fundamental powerful tools to help people's abilities and to help people in their problem solving skills um, and to teach uh, I think one of the most important things that some video games teach today the good ones is ethical and moral questioning where you can really pick or choose do I want to be the good guy or do I want to be totally evil and by choosing you know those care those sort of options in the game you get to really virtually experience the consequences for doing good and bad things and the games that do that well like kind of create real world punishments when you steal things or when you kill people without cause 
and you know sort of rewards for helping people and saving the town and you know there there are these the games that really do the right thing are teaching moral and ethical consequences, teaching how you ask questions, teaching communication skills, you know, with virtual sort of communication between characters that have decision trees and things that you can talk about and things that you can ask them questions and they will give you information that's important to the virtual storyline and either solving the case, you know, defeating the evil wizard or whatever, you know, your goal is in sort of the process. Um, so the ability for video gaming to be an amazing tool is there. However, there's so much crap uh, and there's so much garbage and there's a, a lot of sort of what are the newer, uh, you know, sort of um, – games that are for pads and for, you know, Android games that are for like phones and iPads. A lot of those games, there's a real mix in there too. Some are like, really want you to think spatially, problem solve, think strategically or tactically. And some are what we call a button masher. Because there's no buttons on the pad, you just kind of pack what you think, bam, 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 bam. You're not really learning anything. You're not really doing anything. You're basically just like a monkey banging the flashy colors at that point. Ooh, 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 flashy colors. Ooh, 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 ooh. And you're not really learning anything except how to be addicted to an electronic device that gives you a, what we call, you know, a, like an orange pellet, you know, every time you, you know, you hit the button. So the potential for these tools to be incredibly addictive to be mind warping and mind controlling and to turn people's brains into mush totally out there the ability for these tools and games to teach people problem solving mental development psionic development ethical and moral choices real combat simulation flight simulation helicopter simulation driving simulation um, you know all kinds of real world simulations that you get an experience of that you don't get an experience of just reading a book about or watching a program. These are interactive experiences. That's the kind of whole point is that by engaging with this thing on a mental, physical, eye-hand coordination way, you're processing a whole bunch more of bits of information and you're learning something. Now, are you learning that you know, cutting giant reptiles in half with a chainsaw is cool if you're playing Gears of War. Or are you learning how wormhole physics works in a game like Portal or Portal 2? So, I mean, these are the things that you could be learning. Do you want to learn something really dumb or negative or do you want to learn something interesting and positive? And it has to do with choices. Uh, and so if, a, if I was a parent and I had a kid who was like, I don't want to play video games, I would probably be the most... Nazi-esque parent as far as like, well, you can play this, but you can't play that. And you can play this, but you can't play that. And you got two hours here and then you got to do your homework because I understand that it's an amazing tool, but I also understand that it's fire. You know, like, I, I mean, as far as, it, as fire is fires technology and a tool too. And, and it has the ability to burn people and to be really damaging. So it's like television. Television is not evil, depending on what you watch yeah. and depending on, on what's coming across the airwaves. If it's just, you know, dumb game shows or soap operas, you're wasting so, your time. If you're watching the Learning Channel or something, then maybe you're learning something. Well, you, you mentioned addictions, okay? And I would imagine, and I was wondering, were you shown, uh, number one, were you shown like the ramifications and the physical uh, effects on the brain from addictions? I'm just curious. You know, you talked about the psionic meter, yeah. Um, I would imagine that would show some of that. And also, they have technology now that literally shows uh, the, the movement of light through the brain to show where it starts and where it ends when a certain thought process goes down. I'm curious, were you exposed to any of that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That, that's all part of the fundamental education. Uh, and addiction, addiction turns out to be the... Um, the obsessive compulsive or uh, a desire to recreate a circumstance that gave you a positive response. And so you may be in a pattern where you're continuing to pursue something that no longer gives you the positive response that it did. Right. But, but any, any addiction is the obsessive compulsive pursuit of that reaction, action, reaction from that thing that that one time made you go, yay, I feel awesome. And whatever that is, whether that's a substance that you're putting in your body or whether that's a physical action or whether it's television or video games, 
or sex or bingo or video poker or whatever you know whatever it is for you if it's something that you can't stop pursuing because you're constantly chasing you know that 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 real reward feeling then you're going to be pursuing an addictive set of uh, addiction set of patterns and behavior how do you stop you know i'm sure you guys learn this kind of stuff you know how do you stop that looping it's got to be something you have to break the cycle no it's because it's neurobiological it's your your neural pathways literally like get into a position and they just want to keep repeating that cycle over and over and over again you literally have to break the cycle and so um if it's something that a person can be removed from like if you basically are living in a situation where you got a drinking problem because all your roommates and your friends drink maybe it's time to move yeah and get a few new friends and stop drinking you know i mean if, if it's if it's something you can remove yourself from you have to remove yourself from it or you have to remove it from you uh and there's really a 72 hour period of mental uh, neurobiological adjustment so any addiction if you can give yourself 72 hours of cold turkey of no no not gonna do it you will then at that point have given yourself some freedom now that doesn't mean after 72 hours you're still not going to want to do that thing but you will have broken the neurobiological neural pathway cycle that will make it less compulsive to have to do that thing and you can start to sort of repattern your behavior based on what you want instead of what is biologically compelling you because you're just following you know you know I, basically a, a pathway I have cycle. to bring this up and I know that we talked about this when I was up at East Saudi, mm-hmm. but uh, Steve we've been working on Steve for a long time everybody knows uh, about my husband Steve and mm-hmm. um, how he had a really horrific uh, childhood um, and we don't well, he must love everybody talking about that huh yeah but he's okay no he, he came he finally came out and said I'm good with this and I want to help people because of what he's gone through good. but through this whole investigation of this one thing that we found was when we were monkeying around with technologies and and frequencies and energy streams and things like this we found out that addictions are a specific program that has been i mean it's not just about the individual themselves and the trauma that happened to them it has also a great deal to do with certain programs that have been written that are being emitted out to the world okay and one instance was uh, through the work with this other individual that I'm not allowed to bring up. Um, we actually triggered a device being thrown up out of Steve's body. Right. Maybe you're telling me about that, yeah. Okay. I have since now received, I think, two emails from two other people who had the same circumstance. And what I want to know from you is, when you've delved into this much brain stuff, and you've delved into psionics, and you've been trained since you were what? You started being trained when you were four, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Randy, I can't imagine for the, you know, I remember asking you one night, how many of you from your division are left? And I think you said 12. Maybe a dozen out of 300, yeah. You guys believe that? Out of out of a 300, there's only 12, well, not Randy's, but <laughs> there's only 12 of them left from that division just after that much battle. And we were talking about how um, it is just so sad, the, the constant torment uh, that's going down with, with a lot of us. I mean, we are so very much targeted. And I'm, I'm not saying everybody else on the planet isn't. I'm just saying when they know that you're waking up and they know that you're stepping out, oh, yeah. they, they know if you're going to take back your power, then you become even more of a target. Oh, yeah. So addictions is one of those avenues they use, especially when you have exceptional gifts that you've come forth in your mission, okay, 
to really make a difference on this planet. I'm curious, have you studied up on that? Have you found some cool information about that? Is there anything you can share through your experience with the military? Because there's a lot of people out there that have written to me about that. Um, there's quite a bit I know about that, I suppose. I don't know. Um, have I stumped him? No, 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 no. no. I mean, I, I, what, I guess what I'm trying to think of how to say is I, I don't spend a ton of time talking about it because sometimes these become things that are so large that people don't know how to deal with it or they become very overwhelmed at thinking that these things are out there coming out to get them and it can make people feel very, very small. So, um, yeah, but you know what? The, our audience. Well, is well, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to answer your question. Right. So okay. the, the, I think that, um, it's most important for people to understand the fundamental psionic technique so that those things are less relevant to them obviously, but there certainly are a large array of tools and organizations who use those tools who wish for people to not be able to think clearly and anything that contributes to people not thinking clearly would be something, a tool that they would use. So when you're talking about like addictive programming patterns put into the collective consciousness, yeah, that's that's an issue. And it is something that's not just because we can become addicted. It's something that becomes easier to happen because there's a program put in by someone else that kind of draws and attracts us there. So um, that's absolutely the case. But I still think that the main thing is to develop your own defense, your own psionic defense against that, and then it becomes just less relevant. Um, those things are only relevant when you're psionically weak and someone else has like psionic power over you. The minute that you have psionic awareness that they're trying to do these things to you is the minute that you can go, ah, I, eh, no, we're not doing that today. Um, and th there's just a huge threshold between how psionically weak a person is by not really having any conscious development and how strong they can become in a very short period of time of just a minimal amount of development. So the difference between being that weak and that manipulative controllable and a little bit stronger and being able to just go, nah, we're not doing that today. Uh, or at least be able to go, no, we're not doing that today, you know, is way different than just being knocked over by something you have no awareness or ability to defend yourself Good against. Good point. And as they say in the military, uh, power comes from knowing thy enemy. And I know we all get kind of caught up on language and, oh, Alexander, don't use the word enemy. But I'm sorry, somebody that's pouring poison in my air, who's pouring, uh, God, I just got a report yesterday. I have to put this out. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are 13 doctors that have either keeled over or have been murdered uh, because they were aware of this, uh, I think it's an enzyme called Nagalase that they are now finding out this is in all of the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. It's actually even being injected in IVs. Anytime you go into a hospital, your chances of receiving this are very high. They're even injecting it in plastic water bottles, for God's sakes. And what it does is it causes the body to accelerate its building of tumors. Uh -huh. Okay, so it makes all of us. This is why, I, if you're if you're like me, you're stepping back and you're wondering why are so many people getting diagnosed with cancer, right? I mean, you've got the obviousness of food and water and soil, but then you have to say to yourself, well, what else is there? And this is what some of these doctors found out, and they were all snuffed. Hmm. Okay. And I found out yesterday that they ha there are people that have definitely determined that this stuff is literally being injected into mm -hmm. your body without your knowledge. Um, and, and, I mean, I can't go any further than that, but what, what I'm saying is uh, psionic capabilities, the ability to know thy enemy is crucial 
right now. Crucial. It's very important for us to step out of our being on our knees role. You know, it's very important. I just had to put that out there. That came in yesterday. I was like, sure. I, I just say this um, when, you know, you're having a disagreement with someone and you're fighting with someone over sort of how to do things or who's going to be in charge of the world. That, that can maybe be a situation where you might not want to look at people as your enemy, but when someone's goal or purpose is to murder you, murder your families, destroy your communities, destroy your cities, and literally destroy the foundations of civilization as we know it, those people are our enemies. We, we should not coddle those people, and we should not look at those people as just being misguided people that need to be re-enlightened. They are trying to destroy and kill us, and therefore they are our enemies, and until we fight them like they are our enemies, they're going to keep winning because it takes fight to win a fight like that and and yeah they're absolutely an enemy if they're trying to kill us utterly and many of them are and that qualifies them as our enemies yes and apps and you know a lot of people will say well let's just send them a wave of love but in the third dimensional reality we do need to take action we do need to step into our authority to recognize well, our own you know, you, you need to recognize that they're there. If you just have this attitude, they can't touch you, um, that's not necessarily going to work. Well, and, and sometimes the notion that you can just send these people love waves and they'll, like, get it someday, sometimes that's not true at all. Some of these people, no amount of love waves will ever change them. And so you, you can't necessarily look at them as just misguided individuals who are lost. Some of them are very, very dark and are making choices. They are choosing to do what they're doing. They're choosing to be who they are. They're choosing to ally themselves with the forces that they are. It's not nearly an unconscious act of someone who just needs more love in their life as so much someone who has chosen a side and they've chosen the wrong side and that makes them our enemy. Yeah, and the fact that they've been given opportunities to, to, to move to the other camp. Oh, yeah. And they've been given these opportunities over and over and over again. So we are getting down to, uh, you and I have talked prior to this about your experiences as a super soldier. Um, and I just, I, I just wanted you to say to people, now these particular types of species that you were up against were typically either the reptoids or the insectoids, as you said. Those were the two primaries. And then you said the dracos came in yeah. Um, which are kind of like a reptoid race. They are. They're they're complicated, and, and we're learning more and more about them, and so we have all kinds of questions to speculate about what they actually are genetically, what race they actually are. Um, we, we, we think that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and so, um, you know, we're learning a lot. But, yeah, they, they, we, we believe that they are – their genetic core a reptilian species well and what I can say is there's plenty of healers out there that have had toe-to-toe -to -toe combat with the Dracos they do exist oh, yeah. they have infiltrated our reality it's very important for us to recognize that they're here and um, I feel if, if, if we continue to not recognize how far this has gone and to really step into our boots right now, this is a very important time, folks, to really step into it and become educated, become more authoritative, become more psionically operative, for lack of better terms. I mean, these are very important things. I think Randy and I, we've talked about it previously, there was a time at 2.30 in the morning that Randy made a comment to me, and I have to bring this up, and I said to him, Randy, how much battle did you see? How much time were you actually out on the field? You know, and you said? Uh, about every three to five days, so probably about twice a week on average. Three to five days. We had a battle clock, we had, we had a war clock, and the war clock would get reset every time we'd have a battle, it would count down, and we would know pretty much between three to five days was when we'd have our next engagement, because it was that predictable. So we had, a, we had a war clock. And then, you know, I can't help myself, I know a lot of people that are around me, I just keep asking a lot of questions, and I was saying, 
so what exactly has happened to you? Now, this is the statement <laughs> that I want everybody to hear. So you said. Uh, uh, what did I say? Um, I've been sliced. Oh, stabbed, burnt, sliced, blown up, shot, ripped apart. I mean, dismembered and bitten, stabbed. I mean, anything that you can think of. I've had my body ripped apart in every way, shape, or form. The, the I, only thing he didn't add to it was. He's been decapitated. And oh, yeah. I went. <laughs> oh, yeah. A few times. I had my head blown right off my shoulder a few times. That's and a I pretty said, surreal experience. Said, this is the best part. I said, well, how, after minutes of <laughs> digesting that statement that he's been decapitated, I said, well, how many times has that happened? And he said, okay, well, then there was that time. And. And it took him like five minutes to count up all the times. And I think you came up to a dozen. It's about a dozen times, yeah, I think, that I've probably had my head separated from my shoulders. And then we were talking about, well, how in the hell can that even happen? You know, is it more important to keep the body or the brain? And how do they keep you alive? And, you know, da-da-da-da. I just – you got to share that with them. What do they do well, when they get the, the head? Well, it's, it's about electrical activity in the brain that maintains your cord so that they can, you know, as long as they can maintain a, a tiny bit of electrical activity and your silver cord is still connected to you, then they can pull you back into your body at some point and you're retrievable at that point. And if they can't pull you back in, then you're unretrievable and that's when you're really dead. Um, but basically the, the medical uh, bulldogs, which are about size of a little school bus and they kind of hover off the ground and they have these atomic thrusters on them they're pretty loud uh the medical bulldogs have you know like these um stasis beds stasis cots in them so that basically you take someone's damaged body or their brain or whatever and or their head and you well Actually, okay, it's even funnier, I guess, if you think about it this way. If you've got a body with a head still attached, you put them in the stasis bed, and the stasis beds have these temporal fields that literally slow down the metabolic process, that literally slows down how fast. So really, it just makes you die more slowly is like this really sort of weird way of looking at it. So it doesn't save your life so much as make you die more slowly so then they can get you back to a real medical center and then put you in the real regenerating bed and connect you and, you know, stabilize you um, but if they your head gets removed from your body then they put you in the fridge they basically have these giant coolers in between the the stasis beds they pull out and they've got these shelves on it these 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 cold shelves that they stack the heads up into and then go back and then tra transplant them back onto clone bodies or whatever and I mean it's this really complicated process but yeah you said, getting, you said getting your head stuck in the cooler and then like nah stick them in the cooler we'll put them back together later it's it's really I asked, feeling strange. I asked him how long of a time period do you have? And you said, what, about 36 hours? Uh, well, I mean, I really the longest period of time I can remember from my getting my head blown off and like coming back to, to work is like about a week and a half, almost two weeks. So there's definitely a recovery or a surgery process that can happen in there that can that can be a while. But it depends. It really depends on how badly you're damaged and how quickly they can throw you back together. So sometimes it's a few days or I mean, if you've really had your whole body blown apart, it can be a few days and you wake up and go, oh, what, what day is it? You know, and it's yeah. Friday. You died on but you, you died on Monday. It's Friday. You're back. Don't worry. You'll be good. <laughs> you'll be back to work on Wednesday. But you were talking about from the time that they retrieve the head and they put it into the refrigerator ice box, <laughs> classic military term, ice box, and they get it back to mm -hmm. the laboratory or the the hospital facility. You have about 36 hours before the silver cord gets. Right, right, right. Yeah, they've got they've got about that amount of time to put your head on another body and stabilize you before you just separate and leave your body. They can only hold you there, sort of cling you to that part of your body for so long before you just detach and leave. And but it really has a lot to do with the individual and how badly you want to stay in your body. Yeah. Like people who don't really want to be there, they're the ones that are going to not be able to be retrieved. People like me are like, no, I'm going back. Like I just kept coming back and yeah. kept coming back because I was very motivated to be back in my body. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then you also were talking about um, 
Oh, you determined that once the head is decapitated, now listen to this, folks, <laughs> how long a period of time are you still consciously aware, even though your head has been cut off? About 15 to 20 seconds. It's less than 30 seconds. It's less than 30 seconds before you lose consciousness from the blood pressure loss in your brain. But... Um, but if but if you get your head blown off from your shoulders and your head is spinning, the centrifugal force can actually keep the blood in your sort of cortex longer, and you might have 30, 40 seconds. But um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't even know what to say. I mean, I have to ask a bunch of you guys out there. Come on, have you not wondered? Did did the person stay alive after they supposedly died? You know, was there a period of time before the consciousness left the body? I've always wondered that. So here it is, 2.30 in the morning, he's telling me this stuff. You can imagine. <laughs> I mean, my jaw was like, anyway, had to divert to that. That's my, and, and I know that it's all weird and strange for everybody else, but for me, that was a Tuesday afternoon. That's <laughs> just so wild. Oh, my God. Well, you know. I know we've talked a lot about psionics, so again, I just want to remind everybody there is a link at the bottom of the screen that will show you exactly where to go to purchase your tickets to see Randy. I think this is such an important workshop. I can't stress that enough. He really knows his stuff. He's been trained properly, and uh, there are things that he has access to that we have not necessarily had access to in the spiritual community. And I really do believe it is, it's way past the point of return. Um, it is a time where we do need to make sure that the spiritual and the science are unified. You know, that's it in a nutshell. So, um, listen, we have about 15, nah, 10 more minutes. And so before I let you go, I'd like to kind of just, do an overview there there were a couple of questions that came in one of them was um, okay this came in from Rosemary it, it was in reference to being asked about the process of limb regeneration and what happens when the repairs are overly extensive uh, you made a comment it was easier to clone and she says I thought he was indirectly saying that he had been cloned without saying that exactly can a clone have a soul and therefore a heart? Because surely Randy is one very big, lovable, hearted human. Oh, uh, thanks. So the main thing about, um, so when you make a clone of somebody in order for, in order for the original bundle of cells to like, Hold cohe you know have cohesion cellular co cellular cohesion uh, it requires a very 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 tiny 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 little sliver of the original uh, subject's uh, soul in order to make that clone live okay. very very tiny 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 little bit and from what I also understand that creates a maximum clone threshold. So that, and I, my understanding is that number is about, about 10,000. So my understanding of that, and again, this is, you know, these guys are working on this. I, it's the only reason I would know this, uh, is if they're trying to clone me, for instance, because they wanted to make a bunch of cannon fodder clones because they thought that, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a great soldier. Maybe if they made a bunch of clones, they'd make good cannon fodder. Uh, they could make 10,000 of them before or about uh, before you would keep trying to make more after that and they just wouldn't hold together anymore because the soul won't allow you to take any more fractions off of it, won't allow you to take any more slivers. It just kind of says, no, that's all you get. You get that many little slivers and I'm not giving you any more. Yeah. Um, and what happened, what we found out when we actually started uh, training the, these clones to try and be soldiers because they only have this little tiny fraction of a soul in them. They're very difficult to train. They're very undisciplined. Uh, they're not very usable or very functional. So clones without souls in them are not very usable. They're, they are not very usable at all. But basically, when because we can transfer the consciousness and the entire soul of a person from one body to another – 
Yeah, I mean, to say the exact number of times that my original body was destroyed and I had to either be put back into a partial clone body or had another one made up and get transferred back into that one because there was really nothing left to work with. Can't say exactly how many times other than that it's happened more than once. So I do know that this body that I'm in right now is not my original. It was a cloned body that I got put back into when I was returned from my 20-year tour of duty. Uh, but it's as much mine as anything else, and it's as much me as I ever was because my real soul and my real consciousness is in that body. So it doesn't matter how, whether it's your eighth or hundredth clone body. If it's still your soul and your consciousness, it, it's your body. It's still you. Um, if, if that doesn't tell you that the soul is you, and the oh, body yeah. comes with the uh, nothing will. And yeah. I was curious, now, does your body look exactly the same? Are there any different marks on your body? I'm not 100% sure other than I used to way more than I do now. I, I used to have experiences where I would spend – way more time in front of the bathroom mirror than a person like me ever does. And I, and I not primping, but staring, like looking, you know, kind of like, what is, is that, is this the same, you know, like really like examining these nuances of my bone structure and my face and everything because something didn't look quite right because something looked like, wait, is that, why, why, why is, am I not quite recognizing myself? What am I looking at that reflection that makes me look different or like, who are you? Um, and so, but I don't do that anymore. I'm perfectly comfortable with this body and looking at this reflection. But there was certainly a period of time when I was younger when things may have been going back and forth or flipped back and forth. And I would look in the mirror and go like, what is – is that right? And did I, did I, did I grow something? Did I get fatter? Did I get thinner? I mean, you know, just going through that whole process of staring at yourself, trying to go, what's different about this picture? What's not, what's, mm, and not really being able to figure it out. And sometimes just after spending way too much time standing in front of the mirror, just going, okay, I can't stand in front of the mirror anymore and <laughs> walk away. Oh my God. What a trip. <clears throat> what a trip. Now, do you do you uh, have anything that you want to share just regarding some current events? And for everyone out there, they really, really enjoyed our last interview. Oh, good. Got some incredibly good feedback. And uh, Randy and I have spoken. We could do some other interviews. It would be really cool for us to maybe do like a news review, you know, something like sure. that. Sure. Especially yeah. for your eyes where you have the uh, military and the off-world perspective of what's really going on. So what do you think is going on with uh, China showing their feathers, you know, r r ruffling their feathers off the coast of Alaska? Do you think this is really nothing more than kind of a, a checkmate situation with the United States regarding Syria, or do you think it's something else? Um. Well, I, I don't think it's necessarily um, the Chinese government like trying to make a power play, like we're going to move into the Arctic. They just announced that they are reducing their uh, entire troop manifest by 300,000 people this year. So they're actually downsizing their military right now. They, they're not upsizing. They built a new aircraft carrier last year. So they've kind of built up their Navy a little bit, but they're getting rid of 300,000 soldiers. So they're making some changes. Uh, but I don't think that like Arctic global domination is is, is the issue. We can never underestimate how often that happens and it's not at all like the Chinese and the U.S. saber rattling each other so much as like um, we have an undersea station or vehicle that we need to help blow up. Will you guys get over here and help us use your special new particle beam on it? And these are sometimes cooperative efforts where we're attacking and fighting off mutually hostile uh, known to be mutually hostile extraterrestrial forces. So it's not always like that. I will say this about uh, drilling in the Arctic. Even though there's been sort of a passive go-ahead, like, okay, now you guys can drill in the Arctic, I want to point out that no one has really been able to do this successfully before, not because no one's ever done it before, but because the logistics of drilling in icy water represents such a difficult, difficult complication that – 
Just because they've given a go-ahead for them to drill in the Arctic doesn't mean anyone's going to drill in the Arctic because they still have to figure out how to do it. All right. No one knows. I mean, no one knows how to put an oil rig up in the Arctic and send a pipe down and drill oil. They don't know how to do it. The only stations that they have, they've had to build these little artificial islands in order to build these pumping stations to pump through the ground because they can pump through the ground, even if it's an artificial ground, but they still can't pump through this icy cold water because it represents all these complications as far as coagulation uh, and viscosity change and so forth in, in crude oil. So it's not at all any kind of a shut and dry, oh, they're going to be drilling in the Arctic. No, they got a thumbs up to drill in one of the most environmentally challenging places to ever conceivably drill where they have not been able to successfully figure out how to drill yet. So just because someone gave them a thumbs up doesn't mean that they're drilling in the Arctic this year at all because the, the, the scientific and engineering complications uh, actually are going to make that really difficult. Interesting. Well, I tell you what, we're getting to the top of the hour, and uh, we're going to go ahead and, you know, maybe Randy will just do a part two. Um, okay. And because and, I have a bu bunch of questions for you still. Oh, really? No way. Questions I for know. Me? You're so surprised, right? <laughs> I, I, I am no longer surprised that people have questions for me. Oh, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, everybody, please check out the Psionics Boot Camp. It's from September 25th through the 27th up at Trout Lake, Washington, up with James Gilliland. You'll be able to kind of kill two birds with one stone, as they say. You'll be able to check out the UFO activity up, up there. You'll be able to feel uh, the Stargate that we really did some cool ceremony um, work on and really cleaned out some stuff up there. I mean, it's, it was really a nice energy when we left. And uh, Randy, go ahead and give me your website. Uh, it's earthcitizenconsulting.org or .com. We have both the sites. So it's all one word, earthcitizenconsulting.org or .com. Okay. And also there is a link to go and purchase the tickets. If you can and if you're willing, would you please make sure you reference Randy and Galactic Connection. It does help both of our causes as well. And with that said, don't forget to check in with Galactic Connection 365 days a year. We've got a lot of stuff brewing behind the scenes right now. Uh, you know, we just need some funding to really take this to the next level. So if there's anybody out there, if there's anybody out there <laughs> who uh, would be willing to sit down and hear our vision and uh, their vision, uh, let us know. Uh, anyway, lots of love. Love you guys. You are awesome. You make my life uh, actually a dream come true. And same to you, Randy. It's like Randy and I have reconnected. Yes. You know, I did that when I was a little girl and I got slapped. <laughs> I got slapped. My father was like, you don't do that. Anyway, so... <laughs> Your dad must have been a very interesting guy. I can just from what you've. He was superb. <laughs> he was superb. He prepped me for where I am today. Seriously. I believe that. So uh, anyway, you guys stay tuned. We're going to bring in some more really cool information with Randy and myself. Um, maybe we'll just. I guess we'll just go ahead and do that for next week if you're good with that. Sure. Yeah. No problem. I got time. And also we have Simon Parks coming up the week after that. I know all of you love talking with him. And Say hi to talks. Simon for me. Yeah, Simon's an awesome guy. Another uncorruptible. And uh, please feel free to check out our website. We do have the world-renowned implant removal process. It does kick butt, uh, the implant removal. And it's so much more than removing implants, guys. I mean, it's so far beyond that. Okay, trust me when I say that. It was divinely guided, literally. Okay, so galacticconnection.com, check us out. We've got all kinds of new things. We've got the spiritual past life clearing, which is really, really powerful. And we've got some other new announcements coming up. So stay tuned. We, lo we love you. And you guys take care from all of us back here at the Galactic Connection team. Lots of love. Thanks, Randy. For Thank you. Us. Thanks for having me, Semper Fi. <laughs> See ya. Bye.